good yet. All right. So tonight we are here for our third uh, cultural diversity series with Maria Durantes. Um, so I'm just here to introduce her briefly and then we're gonna give her the floor. Uh, remember it is not a class. So if you have any questions, please feel free to either chime in in the chat or um, you may unmute yourself and ask those questions, but we're all here to learn tonight. So without any further delay, we've got Maria Durantes. Hello. Um, so yeah, my name is Maria Dorantes. I, I'm a registered nurse at Advocate Aurora Kenosha. I've been there for about um, five years, started as a CNA, um, then nurse intern, graduate nurse, and then when it passed the NCLEX registered nurse. I went to Gateway Technical College and I am uh, currently enrolled in uh, Chamberlain University for our RN2 NP program. Um, still thinking about what I want to do um, with my future nursing career, but that's the beauty of nursing, right? You can do whatever you want, wherever you go. Um, there's always a spot for you. Um, I currently work at the PACU, which um, if some of you don't know, it's the post anesthesia care unit. It's the uh, unit where patients come straight out of the OR, out of uh, the surgery. Um, so when they wake up, uh, uh, I deal with that. Uh, Kids, grownups, elderly, um, patient, we take care of patients of all kinds of ages, all kinds of surgeries. So I love my job. I love the PACU. Um, after doing med search for about a year as a nurse um, and four years as an aide, um, or three years as an aide, um, I was ready for a change. So PACU really fit well with me. Um, I am a uh, Mexican. I am, uh, well, I was born in Waukegan, Illinois, but both my parents are um, Mexican. They immigrated here uh, to Waukegan in 1987, so they've been here for a very long time. Um, I am fluent in Spanish. I am bilingual, um, and I love to use my uh, Spanish to be able to help my community and help my patients as much as I can, um, and also help educate other, other nurses, my peers, a lot of the times on how to help our community and help my, my people. So um, my first slide here, who are Latino patients? Um, one big thing is a lot of people don't know the difference between Hispanic and Latino. Um, so a lot of patients may identify as Latino or may identify as Hispanic. Hispanic is said to be the person that um, their primary or indigenous language comes from Spanish. So um, a person from Spain may be Hispanic, but Latino means you come from Latin America or you descend from Latin America. So um, a person from Brazil may be Latino, but they don't speak Spanish, they speak Portuguese, so they're Latino, they're not Hispanic. A person from Spain may be Hispanic because they speak Spanish, but they're not Latino because they don't come from Latin America. So that's something that a lot of people don't know or don't understand. You know, they're, they're not interchangeable, but a lot of people do use them. Um, I'm Mexican. I consider myself Latina, um, but Hispanic is what I write down when I'm doing paperwork or anything like that because Latino is not an option. So, um, so that's kind of the geography of Hispanic and Latino. Um, but biology wise and geography wise, I think the one thing that we need to um, pay attention to a lot and, and know is that we can't assume where our patients are from just because they're Hispanic or they're Latino. Um, biology wise, Latinos come in all shades and all shapes and all colors. Um, we have our Afro Latinos. I'm Mexican, very proud of my roots, but I am light skinned and have green eyes. A lot of the times we have that stereotypical thought of Latinos are darker skin, black uh, or brown eyes. Um, and that's not necessarily the truth. You know, I've, I've had many times where people don't believe that I'm Latina or um, question my uh, upbringing or where I'm from or question if one of my parents isn't. Um, just because I'm light skin and green eyes. So I think that being aware that our Hispanic and Latino population um, come in all shades, shapes and colors is very important to not assume. Um, a lot of Afro-Latinos are Puerto Rican, Dominican, you know, you may get kind of like, oh my God, you speak Spanish. Yeah, they speak Spanish and yeah, they're black, but they're also Latino. Um, so that's the beauty of Latinos and Hispanic, I guess, because we are so diverse. Um, we come in many different backgrounds. Um, so that's why there's no necessarily standard way to care for a Latino or Hispanic patient because we're so diverse and we have so many different backgrounds. Our culture, our traditions are huge amongst us um, and they're very embedded into us, you know, and I, 
I guess I don't want to generalize because there are a lot of Latinos and a lot of Hispanics that have maybe lost that culture, that tradition, but being respectful of those cultural traditions that they have um, is very important, especially when taking care of your patient and especially when trying to build a good rapport with your patients, you know, not assuming that because they're um, Mexican, they're Catholic, or because they are um, Dominican, they speak Spanish, you know, um, and with that said also, speaking about the language, um, we shouldn't assume that there's always a language barrier. You know, I see that a lot when um, pre-opping patients and a patient with a Spanish last name comes on um, to the board and everybody's like trying to not take the patient because they think they're gonna have to use the interpreter and it's gonna take longer. Um, as a Latina nurse, I always try to take as many patients as I can of color and that I know have that language barrier because I know that if a Hispanic or Latino patient sees a nurse that speaks their language, they're automatically gonna feel a lot more comfortable with me. Um, so I encourage you to do the same. If you are Latino, you are Hispanic, you know, if you know that you're gonna make that patient stay better or you know they're gonna make that patient stay and you're gonna make a difference in that patient stay or in that patient surgery, you're gonna make them feel comfortable, you know, um, go out of your way to do that. It's honestly, um, you can see the relief on a patient's shoulders, you know, they just feel a lot more relieved when they know that somebody like them is taking care of them. Um, also with that being said though, interpreters, um, it's always legality of it too. Um, when you do have that language barrier, when you do have that patient that doesn't speak English, making sure that that interpreter is available for that patient. Um, even though I speak Spanish and I may speak to my patient in Spanish, I'm not going to interpret for the anesthesiologist or for the surgeon or for the OR team because there's a legality to that. I'm not legally able to do that. Um, so I may be able to do my pre-op questions with my patient in Spanish, but I'm going to make sure that my patient has an interpreter there and make sure that it's there available for them so that the anesthesiologist and the surgeon doesn't, doesn't just come in, say things that I know my patient isn't gonna understand and then just move on. Um, so being that advocate for that patient is very important as well. Um, I'm obviously not here to teach you about uh, the main diseases that come with uh, different communities, but with Latinos, I think that the main thing is the fact that the lack of care leads to a lot of these diseases that um, Hispanic or Latino community have. Heart disease is the leading cause amongst Latinos. And a lot of the times that has to do with hypertension. A lot of our Latino community or Hispanic community have hypertension and they don't even know it. You know, they don't call it the silent killer for nothing. Um, so making sure that we are educating our patients and to following up with primary care, you know, especially if you see the patient in the ER and you see that they don't have a primary care, look into some, some resources, you know, look into community health, whatever it is. Um, making sure that you are not just brushing off that patient just because they, well, they don't have a primary, they don't see a primary. So whatever, they're going to go home with 180 blood pressure, but eh, it's their problem. You know, making sure that we're advocating for our patients, just how we would advocate for any other patient, you know, finding resources. Um, and just that teaching that has to come with our patients. Um, type two diabetes as well, you know, our Hispanic population is uh, very propensed to type 2 diabetes. And, um, you know, I may say that it has a lot to do with uh, nurture versus nature because of our diet, because of how we eat, because of, you know, our, our food has a lot of tortillas, a lot of uh, carbs, um, but making sure that we're educating our patients, even if they're coming in for something else and teaching them about um, type two diabetes and the, how propensed they are to have that. Um, just knowing your population in general, whether it's Latino or black or whatever, you know, knowing your population and knowing um, what you should be able to teach and uh, help them with. Um, religion and health. So this is uh, something that I've seen a lot. Like I said, I'm, I'm Mexican, my parents are immigrants. I have a lot of family, I have a lot of friends. Um, my in-laws, um, there's a huge correlation with health and illness with God. And that's why a lot of the times, you know, being a nurse, 
and kind of knowing the science behind things, I never really understand why sometimes our Hispanic or, or Latino population take a diagnosis so hard. But Hispanic and Latinos correlate illness with doing wrong by God, with uh, God punishing them. A lot of the times they think that that's a punishment. They didn't pray enough. They weren't good enough. They weren't good people. You know, I remember my dad getting diagnosed with diabetes and him saying, I'm paying everything I did in my life now because now I have diabetes. You know, it's the thought of that. And, you know, he fell into a big depression. A lot of times when they when they do this, they take this very hard and, you know, understanding that and not saying like, well, I don't understand what the big deal is or brushing it off with those patients, understanding that for them, it's a huge deal to fall ill um, because in their minds, it's God is punishing them for something. Um, the same thing with health, being healthy in their minds is I'm doing right by God. Um, and that's what God is well, you know, uh, it, it may be very hard for family because family is very huge um, with our Latino and our Hispanic uh, populations, as I'm sure a lot of people know. Um, but death is something that in our in in the Latino or Hispanic mind, a lot of the times is, well, God is calling me up there. So they are essentially, you know, a lot of the times okay with their faith, you know. So a lot of the support has to be a lot with the family you know having the family understand because the family family is super close latinos and hispanics are a very close family driven um culture so um with that too the attitude towards mental health a lot of times you'll see or hear your patients especially when they come to the er say um you know oh uh, i have los nervios or i have nervios to them Nervios, which actually translates to nerves, which kind of makes sense, um, is a lot of times anxiety, um, depression. You know, people will say, oh, I have a lot of nervios. Oh, I have a lot of anxiety. You know, I have anxiety sometimes. Um, so that's something that is very, mental health is something that is very frowned upon. Um, mental health is something that is very covered and taboo amongst Latinos and Hispanics still now to this day. Um, and I think it's a lot better with our young, younger generations, but with our older population, our older Hispanic population, that's something that has always been taboo. You don't talk about your mental health. Depressed? What are you so depressed about? You have a nice house. You have a nice car. You have a career. You shouldn't be depressed. That's always been taboo for our community. And I think that understanding a lot of the times that's why they fall into alcoholism or whatever it may be, understanding that there's a background to that, you know, people have very hard upbringings and they don't deal with that. They have trauma that they don't deal with. They deal with it with the bottle on the weekends, you know, so understanding that background and being under, just being understanding of that taboo that it is for mental health and not only for Latinos you know a lot of black people talking about mental health is not okay a lot of Hmong people you know you don't talk about mental health mental health is not is not something that you talk about it's taboo in a lot of cultures um but understanding that and understanding that may they may express it in a different way is very important um with that also the attitude towards healthcare professionals and um which includes respect and fear um a lot of the times when you don't speak the language and you're going to the ER with all these people who don't speak your language, um, it's very fearing. You know, imagine being in a, in a different country and on vacation, all of a sudden you're with the doctor that's telling you all these things and you just don't know even what they're saying. Um, it's, you know, a lot of people are afraid of doctors, are afraid of going to the hospital, are afraid of the hospitals in general. There's this huge saying that um, al hospital vas a morir, to the hospital you go to die. You know, it's, it's a huge thing amongst uh, Latinos and Hispanics to where if you're going to the hospitals because you're really sick and you're not going to get out of there. Um, but with that, same, with that same breath, there's a huge respect amongst nurses and towards nurses and um, doctors. And I'm not going to generalize and say that everybody, you know, you have your patients that you know, aren't very nice in every culture, in every background, not just Hispanic, not just Latinos. Um, but knowing that as long as you respect them and you try your best to advocate for them and to work with them, they'll work with you as well. Um, 
a huge thing that I want to talk about too is our food. Um, our food is a huge part of, of our Latino culture, and I'm sure a lot of you guys know. Um, and it, a lot of the times when people fall ill with diabetes or hypertension, things like that, um, the fact that there's uh, dietary restrictions is what takes it for us. You know, if you take away our food, you're taking away our culture. Um, if you're Latino or if you're Hispanic, you know that on the weekends, you prepare a huge feast and your whole entire family comes and eats. You know, whenever you celebrate something, everybody brings a meal. Whenever you're celebrating, you know, a birthday, graduation, whatever, that taquero is there and there's all this food to uh, for everybody to eat and everybody to indulge in. You know, our food, for one, it's delicious and it's... Um, very diverse and it's one of the best cuisines in the world um just saying um so with our food it's taking away our food is taking away our culture so one thing that i found a lot of the times is replacing the say of oh well you have restrictions like you can't eat this with healthy alternative alternatives teaching our patients especially if you're in the clinic or whatnot teaching our patient that okay you can't eat white bread but you can eat uh, whole wheat bread or you can't eat four tortillas every meal, but you can eat one, you know, being able to be flexible with your patients, they're going to comply a lot better because a huge thing with food is non-compliance. If you tell a Hispanic man that he, because he has diabetes, he can't eat tortillas, he's going to brush it off and still eat the tortillas. So and I learned that a lot with my father, again, you know, having to tell him, well, it's not that you can't eat tortillas, it's that you can't eat six tortillas in every city, you know, eat one or two. Um, being able to be flexible with them. Um, being an inpatient nurse as well, one thing that I did a lot and I, you know, it, it went very well with my patients was if my patient was on a regular diet, I'm not going to make him eat the hospital food. The hospital food isn't good for anybody, not just Latino and Hispanic patients. It's just not that great. Um, so if I have a wife that's constantly calling me to see how her husband is, I tell her, hey, you want to bring him a meal? You know, he he's, doesn't like the food here. He's not eating very well. Can you bring him your food from home? You know, family, again, very close knit. They're going to do whatever you say, whatever you say to help their family member get better. So, you know, be, if they're on a regular meal, being able to tell them, you know, just tell your wife to bring your meals, you know, bring your breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, we'll warm it up here, whatever. They're going to be better. They're going to take care of themselves better. They're going to um, get be better faster because they see they, a lot of the times it's, it's just not wanting to be in the hospital, not wanting to comply. And if you work with them, they'll work with you again. Um, or if even if they are in dietary restrictions, that's a huge educating point, like a point where you can do some patient education, you know, tell the wife, well, you can't bring this because it's high in salt, but you can bring that, you know. Um, Again, just being aware that our food is a huge part of our culture. And when you say you can't eat that, Latino and Hispanic patients feel like you're taking away their living. You know, I remember my dad saying, well, it's about quality of life also. And it is, it is about quality of life. You know, what life is it if you can't eat what you love, if you can't eat who you are, if you can't eat your food? Um, again, with that said, La Familia, and I hope you enjoy my family pictures there. <laughs> um, family presence is huge. And not only that, but family presence when ill is huge. And I know that if you work in the hospital, you've had a Hispanic patient, have you seen 10 people in that room? And I know that it's hard for you to do your job when you walk in there and you're trying to take vitals and there's 10 other people just staring at you and seeing what you're doing and you know you're trying to just go into the room I know that it is again talk to your patients work with them you know a lot, they're not going to take offense a lot of the times if you say hey you know I know that your family is super involved I know that they want to be here but I can't do my job if there's 10 people here can you please talk to your family members as to when they come visit you you know two three at a time um because a lot of the times family coming to see you is more for the family than for the patient. And I know this sounds a little off, but 
if a family member doesn't go see a family member who's sick, that's a bad family member. That's a bad rep for that family member. Oh, did you hear that so-and-so brother was in the hospital and he didn't even go see him, you know, type thing. Um, so a lot of the times just talking to the family, you know, talking to the immediate family, talking to the patient, and again, working with them as to like when they can have visitors and when they can't is huge um, to be able to you do your job and them feel like you're respecting their culture, you're respecting their, um, their traditions. Um, also, you know, don't ever be afraid to tell your patient, you know, Hey, you know, your, your kids are being a little too loud. My patient next door is, is, um, is trying to rest just how you would with any other patient, you know, again, they're not going to take offense to that, you know, and if they do, well, well, so be it. You would do it for any other patient. Um, you know, if your patient next door is on hospice and they're trying to rest and they're being rowdy, you know, just talk to your patient, talk to the family, you know, it's, you're trying to do your job as well. Um, with that also matriarchy and patriarchy, Hispanics and Latinos are huge, um, with the male dominated culture. It's a hugely male dominated culture, but also as weird as this sounds, the woman of the house, the matriarch, a lot of the times has the last day. So understanding that too, that um, understanding the culture and understanding that maybe if you are talking to one spouse and that spouse wants to talk to their other spouse before making a decision, especially if it's about a surgery or whatever, that's very common, you know, um, just how any other spouse would try to get their spouses and for, um, advice or input into something that has to do with their health. Um, and then also um, alternative medicine. A lot of the times um, Hispanics are very weary or very, um, they don't really understand traditional medication. And it goes, you know, not everybody, like I said, there's a lot of our older Hispanics, our older Latino population that believe in alternative medicine more than Western medication. Then you have a younger generation that may believe more into Western um, medication. And then there's people who just believe in both. Um, Remedios caseros, um, which are a lot of the times teas or um, limpias, which is like cleanses, um, have a lot of maybe placebo effects, maybe not so placebo effects, because there are studies done about teas that help with certain diseases. You know, hibiscus helps with high blood pressure. Um, and a lot of them drink a lot of hibiscus water when they do have blood pressure. Um, knowing that also is very important for you when you are trying to treat. And for example, for me, for pre-op, if I have a Hispanic patient and I will ask him, do you take any type of teas or any type of supplements? because a lot of the times that may interact with their anesthesia or may interact with their bleeding um, and everything. So being aware that many of them may take some teas or do other supplements um, instead of taking Western medication is very important for your patient's care. Um, hot versus cold also. Um, there's a huge Thing about cold causing um, illness. You know, a lot of Hispanics believe that pneumonia comes from the cold. If you have a cold, you get pneumonia. Um, or if you walk with your bare feet in the cold floor, you're going to get sick. You're going to get the flu. Um, so for example, when patients, my patients have surgery, it's just customary to offer them ice chips right after surgery because their mouth is really dry. Well, if I have a Hispanic or Latino patient, I might not want to offer them ice chips because that's cold. And if they're sick or they're trying to heal, they believe that the cold does them more ill than, does them more bad than good. So I may just add, offer them room temperature water. Things like that make a huge difference in how your patient views their, the, how they're receiving their, their health care. Um, curanderos also, um, which are just like healers, that has a huge indigenous roots to it. Um, our curanderos um, may do like something we call sobadas. Hispanics believe in that a lot, which essentially is just a massage or um, some sort of non-medical chiropractic um, procedure. But a lot of the times they really do believe in this. And if even if you don't believe in it, just listening and knowing that that's what they may be doing. You know, if one person says, well, I'm having this pain, and, you know, and they go and get the curandero to do a sobada, um, they feel better. You know, however it went, 
they feel better. So just knowing that a lot of that has a lot to do with their uh, indigenous roots and traditions and not looking at them like what, what, you know, just, just listening and understanding that that's just their traditions. That's just their culture. Um, another thing is a lot of times with sick children, you will hear a lot el mal de ojo, um, the evil eye, if you've ever heard it in Spanish. Um, and that's, you know, I hear nurses asking like, what, what is that? You know, we believe that if you see a kid and you, you know, saw them with a heavy eye with, you know, kind of envy a little bit, you know, such a cute kid, you may give them mal del ojo. And so a lot of the times with our sick children, if they go to the ER and they mention that, well, you know, somebody, you know, mentioned how cute they were and didn't touch him, you know, don't look at them like, uh, what, you know, it's just their beliefs that sometimes kids get sick because adults look at them funny or look at them with envy or look at them in a, the wrong way. Um, so that's just the thing. If you ever hear that mal de ojo, you know, it's just parents trying to be protective of their kids. And just that's what they believe. They believe that um, if people look at your baby wrong, they might get sick, that that's where their sickness comes from. So as much as you want to explain to them, no, it's a virus, they might think, no, 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 it's in mal de ojo. Um, so just knowing that a lot of Hispanic and Latino uh, population, they have a lot of indigenous roots. They have a lot of remedios or alternative medication that they follow um, and that they may seek other type of health care. You know, if you work in a clinic and you see these patients, you know, if you want to take the opportunity, ask them about these things. Are you receiving another type of health care? Because it should be able to work together and not um, harm the patient or harm the medication that you're trying to administer or whatnot. Any questions? Doing great, Maria. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Does anyone have any questions for Maria? No. Or any input if, if you're Latina and you're Hispanic? Any, just, any input? Just, just an um input. Um my I'm I'm Mexican and my husband he actually um needed a massage too. So he went to one of those I, I didn't know what it was called. You call it a curandero? Yeah. Yeah, he went and he said that it actually helped. So Yeah. Just, and I'm sure it has some type, you know, if if you are having some type of muscle pain, you know, and you get a massage, that that works, that helps, you know. So I'm, it has some type of benefit to it. So I I don't necessarily not believe in it. Um, am I gonna go run to get uh, a sobada? I don't know, but you know, my parents do, and um, a lot of my family do. So. All right. Um, I was gonna say, is there anything else that you wanted to maybe mention that wasn't in your presentation or? There's anything? so much that I could talk about. Um, just being Latino and Hispanic and being so um, close to my roots and just being able to help my Latino population as being a nurse, there's so much that I could talk about, but um, yeah. I mean, I personally, I've, like, I'm, I'm not a nurse for all of you on the call who know me, you know, I'm not a nurse. Um, but I truly enjoy it. Like you can tell that you're very passionate about it and that it's something that's very close to you and that, so and it, that really comes through and how you're presenting and how you're, how you're talking about it and how, you know, you're more than likely treating your, your patients too. So it's really, it's, it really kind of like comes through when you, when you do talk about it, you do kind of light up about it. So it's been Thank really you. interesting to listen to all of this and also to see you present it. Thanks. All right. Yeah, it, was, it was definitely exciting, um, like listening to this, and I was really looking forward to like chiming in and hearing about all of this stuff. So, thank you, Priscilla. You're welcome. Well, if no one has any other questions or comments yeah. for Maria, then we'll let you guys go on your Friday night. Maybe, thank else? you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you guys for chiming in. Bye.